Hey. All right, good afternoon. Today we're going to do lecture three out of the book of Judges. And uh, we're going to begin in Judges chapter 2, verse 14. And we're going to follow all the way through up until our first judge. I've titled today's lecture, Rise of the Judges. And it's going to fill in the gap as to what it is that God thinks about his children. How it is that God looks upon humanity. Many people are misconstrued in their understanding of God. They have an inaccurate knowledge of God. God is first and foremost a God of love. It's his great love that allows him to give people over to what their heart truly desires. If their heart truly desires evil or sin, he will give them over to that. That means he'll release them and let them go. It's his great love that allows that. But if their heart seeks after him, he will draw them in. So any person that seeks after God will find God. God will find them. He will go out and search for that lost sheep. That sheep that knows it's lost and alone. And he'll bring it back upon his own shoulders. Protecting it. Carrying it above the evil. The judge is just that. The judge is an individual that God created in order to do his work. The word judge comes from the root to judge and it means to pronounce a sentence for or against so it is somebody that is filled with the truth first and foremost realize this the judge is somebody that God has raised up and filled with his Holy Spirit somebody that is being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God they are not worshiping false gods people that say that are wrong they are either just ignorant of what the Bible teaches or they're intentionally saying the wrong things to make it out into what it's not. The judge is somebody who is wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll say, well, what about those with sin in their lives, like Samson? Samson was a rebel that loved the Lord, knew him as his father, and looked to him as his holy father. But I'm going to show you that every judge was given over to the true Lord God. So the judge, from its very name, it means the one who is filled with the truth and speaks accurately pronouncing a sentence either for or against. He separates the righteous from the evil, the self-willed from those dedicated to God. It also means the one who has spoken the judgment for or against and by implication will vindicate or punish. He will extend his government either passively, which means through leading and showing the way and waiting for those to follow him, or he will speak against the evil, condemning it, and then will seek to go against it and contend for that which is right by defending the truth and striking down that which is evil. The judge is a literally extension of the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ and is part of the great mercy that God has for us. I'm about to show you that. So, Father, I pray that you bless the reading of your word. Bless those who are listening. Give us wisdom and knowledge, liberally, upright and not. In Christ's name I do pray. Amen. In verse 14, it says, The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. He delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies, round about, so they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Now, as we study in the last lecture, that literally speaks about a father who has full authority and ownership of a daughter. But he gives her to a man, sells her to a man that wants to use her as a slave, to abuse her physically, mentally, sexually. So in verse 15, it takes off from there. It says, Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. And as the Lord has said, and as the Lord has sworn unto them, they were greatly distressed. This picture that's, that's given by verse 15 is like a sheepdog. It's the, the shepherd who is over the sheep. He sees everything from the hillside, and he can see when the sheep try to go the wrong way. So he whistles and gives a command, and a sheepdog will go run around the outside to drive the sheep back to where they should be. And the sheepdog does it by 
many times running and then leaping in the air and hitting the sheep and knocking it down and rolling it. Other times he'll grab it by the back leg and drag it back to where it should go. Sometimes by the nose, I've seen him, I've seen sheep dog do that, grab them by the nose or by the ear and literally pull them back into where they should be. Verse 15 speaks about the mercy of God the Father, that he sees how these people, his children, are keep going the wrong way. He's trying to lead them into the greener pastures, but they keep wanting to go back to the old ground that's already been eaten up. And sheep have to be kept moving or they will destroy the roots and turn a green valley into a dead piece of land. And that's what this speaks about. It speaks about how God wants to take them into a greater place. But they're fighting him. And my friend, that is the will of God for our lives, for your life, for my life, for all his children. God wants us to continue going into the greener pastures. You cannot live off the old manna. The old ground will not support us, so we have to keep following the shepherd. And if we seek to go our own way, the hand of the Lord will be against us for evil. And that word evil means self-will. It means rejecting God's will and doing witchcraft, crafting out your own will. Why? Because the Lord had sworn unto them that he would do this. And because of this, they were greatly distressed. It's interesting. The Bible tells us in the New Testament it means those who are the Lord's, those that love the Lord, will not find his commandments grievous. And that's what this means. It means that they were distressed. They found his commandments grievous. They wanted to give themselves over to the fleshly lusts and desires. And the idea of sitting and resting in the Lord, abstaining from things that were sinful, it caused them distress. It put them in the valley of deciding between right and wrong. And because their flesh was so strongly against them doing right, it was tearing them apart. It was a war between the flesh and the spirit. So because of this, verse 16, God seeing the stress they were under, how they were fighting against the sin of the flesh, a curse that they were all born with. Verse 16 says, that's the reason he raised up judges. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hands of those that spoiled him. Now, what's interesting is when it says that the Lord raised up, it means he literally created the judge. Raised it up, it means he had this judge be born at that specific moment, that time, and then grow to age. So at the proper age for it to come forth, it was already prepared. That means the hand of God was upon the judge from before birth. God had prepared it before it was ever conceived in the womb. From Othniel till the end. His hand was upon them. Their emotions, the way that they were raised, the thoughts that they had, the understanding of God, it all played a part in it. He raised up this person that could tell the difference between right and wrong, that could separate between what was true and what was false. And they would speak and they would condemn that which was false, and they would confirm that which was true. But then, they would lead the ones who wanted to follow them into righteousness, and they would strike down and destroy the ones that were for evil against God. He did this so he could deliver them out of the hands of those that spoiled them. And the word deliver here means to cause them to be free. So many people believe they are free, but they are not. Ironically, many people that are indentured servants or slaves, they think they're free. I know people that are slaves to addictions. I know pastors that are slaves to their board of their church. I had a pastor recently tell me how upset he was because he wanted to preach his own message, and the board wouldn't okay it. Since when does a board tell God's pastor what they can or cannot preach. Since when does a board, elders or deacons, tell a man, a pastor given by God to the church, what materials he will use? When does a pastor's wife tell him when and what he shall teach? God is the only one speaking to the pastor. 
and the pastor is supposed to be the leader of the church by God's own hand. These judges would deliver them out of the hands of those that spoiled them. And what's interesting is this terminology for spoiled, it means they would continually rob and plunder them. They took that which was good from them and left them just enough to keep them miserable. All around me today I find people that go to church with the happy Christian face, but then at home they're miserable. It's because the enemy's plundering, stealing their joy, taking that which God wants them to have. And they do it through the cares of the world, through the ways of men. My friend, God wants you to have joy. It's God's will for you to have peace. But you have to follow the judge. You have to follow the ultimate judge, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Shaphat. And that's what judge means in the Hebrew, is Shaphat. The one who would be raised up to tell the people what was wrong from what was right. Who would lead them into the truth. And the way he did it was the Via Dolorosa. The path of rejection, condemnation, path of suffering. All those around him stood and spit at him, and they rejected him, and they called him names. And then they crucified him and hung him. But the cross, which was the instrument of his death, was the instrument of our righteousness. Our sins were nailed to that cross. And we are to walk that pathway that the Savior walked, the pathway of rejection, where we'll be ridiculed, spoke against. Verse 17. God raised up these judges to deliver them out of the hands of the ones taking the joy and peace they should have. The light of life God wanted them to have. But they would not hearken unto the judges. It means they wouldn't listen to the judge. They ridiculed the judge just like they did Jesus in his time. My friend, if you try to live the life of Christ, you will have very few friends. True friends. You will have Christians that claim they're your friends, but they separate from you. Your church will turn against you. Your pastor will despise you if you try to correct him. My friend, walking the path of truth, being a judge as you are now once you've been given to Christ, because you're a Christian, a light of Jesus Christ for the world, by the very presence of the Holy Spirit in you, you separate the light from the darkness. You show that which is true from that which is false. They would not hearken unto the judges, but they went whoring after other gods. And this means they literally committed adultery. They fornicated, and because of this they perished. It's interesting because it talks about becoming diseased to the point to where a disease goes into you because of your lifestyle and it destroys you. They went after the other gods and they bowed themselves to them, and they turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in. Obeying the commandments of the Lord, they did not so. You see, the forefathers, Joshua and the elders, had followed the ways of God. Joshua said, listen, I know after I die, you guys are going to give yourselves over to the gods of this world. You're going to follow the things of the people around us. But it ain't going to be that way for me and my household, Joshua said. He said, for as me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So because of this, the Lord raised them up judges, verse 18. And the Lord was with the judge. That means the presence of God was in the judge. And he spoke through the judge. God worked through the judge. That judge wasn't on his own. He was literally filled with the presence of the living God. And the living God was working through him. But Samson lifted up gates that they said had to be 22 to 25 tons and carried them up the hill, 40 foot wide, 20 foot high, solid iron, with the posts, which would have been trees, and then threw 22 to 25 tons of metal and wood from the side of a mountain so that it hit the city. That's the power of God, and it's unstoppable. It's the same power that would part the Red Sea or that would destroy an Egyptian army, the same power that would create the worlds. He raised them up to judges, and the Lord was with the judge. And you know what? And delivered them out of the hands of their enemies. Even if the people refused to follow God, like they did, and you're going to see in the life of these judges, they would half-heartedly commit, but then they would turn back out of fear. But God didn't care. You see, God will go into the dark and bring that child out, whether it likes it or not. 
God has no fear. God controls everything. Everything fears God. And when God would go into the judge, that judge would go into the darkness and lead those people out and destroy the enemy even if they didn't help him. In his death, Samson slew more Philistines than in his life, which means at least five to 25,000 died. And if he would have asked, God would have preserved him, but he asked to die with his enemies. It's the only reason Samson died. He delivered them out of the hands of their enemies all the days of the judge. Why? Because it repented the Lord of their groanings. You see, God does not like having to punish his children. No parent in their right mind that loves their children likes to see their children suffer. No parent likes to hear a child cry. Just like in Egypt, God hears the groanings of those in the Canaanite, the promised land. And he will hear your groaning today. My friend, if you're oppressed, vexed by sin, maybe those you love are, are involved in sinful practices. I pray for my children and grandchildren multiple times a day. My stepchildren, my wife, my ex-wife, I pray for everybody several times a day. Those that I counsel, even the ones that badmouth me, I pray for them every day. I pray for them in love, not for God to strike them down. I will go into the dark to help that person in need. Why? Because God causes us to be a judge. He fills us with the power. He empowers us to do his work. My friend, if God has called you to a ministry, you have the power to do that ministry. Why? Because it's not in you. It's in Jesus Christ. When you've been given the spirit of a prophet, you know when somebody's preaching the word from right from wrong. So delicately pray for them and ask God to speak through you to witness to them, to put them on the right path. Use everything with the love of God. Let Jesus Christ and the love of Jesus Christ be that which tailors your hands, which curtails your attempts, which applies whatever it is God has given you to the situations and people around you. God hears our groanings by the reason of them that oppress them and vex them. Oppression, it's interesting, it means they would plunder and take that which they had. But vex is different. Daka, or vex, it literally gives it the idea of them cursing them. Now, the vexing means to put a curse or disease upon to afflict not only them, but more so to afflict their children and their lineage after them. Vexing is where they try to curse you and your descendants. And that's a terrible thing. See, the devil doesn't just want to defeat you. He wants to destroy your children and their grandchildren. See, he can't stop you from being saved once you're saved, but he'll try to vex you to make your testimony no good so that your children don't see the power of God in your life and they turn to the gods of this world. They may claim they're Christian, but if they don't see the power of God in you, the faith of God working through you, they will not desire God. That's what vexing does. Verse 19, it came to pass when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves under their fathers. Now what's interesting, it's the word mafta, and it literally means the body to die of natural causes or be violently slain, martyred. In other words, their death was for God's sake. That the people returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers. And this means, the word corrupted here means they went into a state of decay. The same word is used in the New Testament through the Greek. When Jesus looked on the fields, he says, Pray the Lord of the harvest that he sends workers into the fields. He says, because the fields aren't perishing, or, or in other words, going to perish. He says, I'm looking at them and they're perishing already. They're already beyond the date of harvest. They're white. They're not golden grain and drying brown. They turn white. means they're rotting on the vine. And the souls around us are rotting on the vine. And when the children of God turn to the things of the world, their children will not be born again. Their seed will begin dying on the vine. You are the vine. Jesus is the root. You're the branch off of Jesus, the vine. And your children will be the fruit. Don't let your fruit die on the vine. And they ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. 
The idea of stubborn way is it's cossack and it means grievous and hard, curlish or churlish. It's obstinate. It's people that think they're right, but they're not. And so they choose their hard way. They would rather fight against the power of God than surrender to it. Because God is reaching out in his mercy and wanting to bless them, but they continually reject him. His anger was hot against them again. And this is the case with every judge. And, and it literally means his face is filled with passion. The word anger here means he's got such a deep love and a passion. And he sees you hurting yourself by rejecting him that it makes him hurt inside and burn inside. He's moved with a zealous love, a jealous love. You want to see a man get angry? Mess with his wife. You see a mother get angry? Flirt with her man or touch her children. I've seen women turn into the most brutal she-bears a life could have when you mess with their kids. God's the same way. We're his bride. We're his children. It angers him. Because this, the people have transgressed my covenant, which I made with their fathers, and have not hearkened to my voice. I will not henceforth, verse 21, drive out any before the nations which Joshua left when he had died. The word Joshua means the Lord saves. God says, I would have driven them out. You would have been free from those that persecuted you. But because you've went against my covenant, he made a covenant with them. If you'll obey me, then I'll give you the good of the land. But if you go to serve the gods of this land, I'll make your way hard. I'll turn you over to them. That's part of God's love. He lets you reap that which you sow. If you want to if you want to do a certain thing or go a certain place, God will let you go there and have all the fullness of it. But if you choose God, he'll drive the nations out. He'll give you peace. They will not even want that which you have. Why does he do this? Well, he's the God that saves. But verse 22, he'll tell you, he does this that he may prove Israel. And that means he's the God that prevails whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily. Neither delivered he them in the hand of Joshua or the Lord that saves. It's interesting because we're in the same place. God has placed us as lights in a world of darkness. He didn't take us out. Jesus says, I pray not that you take them out of the world, but rather that you keep them. What do you mean? Put your protective around them, Father, and keep them away from those that would vex them, curse them, and spoil them. Do this was the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a light set on a hill. A candle that is set up on the top cannot be hidden. Don't let your candle be placed under a bushel. Interesting, bushel symbolic of a devil or a saw ear it means a dark covering to keep your light from shining. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. This means your way of life, the work that you do, is dedicated to God the Father. And they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. And that literally means they will become worshipers of Him and they will give Him glory and praise. You want to see people saved? It's not through beating them on the head of the Bible. It's through living the Bible. Devoting your heart, mind, soul, and spirit to God and loving Him for who He is. Because, my friend, He loves you in spite of what you are. I'm a man filled with sin. You're a woman or a child or a man filled with sin, and yet God loves us beyond compare. He gives us the love of our heart. Like R.A. Torrey said, you'll have as much of Jesus in your life as you want. Drink deep from the cup the Lord gives you and give him praise. He talks about the nations the Lord left to prove Israel. Many as had not known all the wars of Canaan, he says it's so that the generations of the children of Israel would be able to teach them war. Those that had not known thereof. This is called spiritual warfare, my friend. You're in a battle for souls. Now there are five lords of the Philistines. Now what's interesting is the word Philistine literally comes from the, the root, patriot. And what it means, it means from the fathers. There are five aspects of the forefathers and all the Canaanites. Now, this is the word Canaanite. 
And what's interesting, it means those that are merchants and traffickers, those that will sell others and that will sell themselves. But also the Sidonians. And what's interesting is, is it, these are the fathers of the Canaanites, fathers of the Sidonians. And Sidonian means the ones that will try to catch the fish. Those are the ones that will try to catch the fish. They try to snare them in nets. So the first of the lords of the Philistines, it means the patriarchal fathers, are the ones that sell themselves and sell others. The second is the ones that try to catch the net, the fish in nets and snares. The third is the Hivites. And what's interesting is it means those that are given over to living in an encampment or a village. You say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Yes, it does. You see, we're ambassadors for Christ. We're living in a world that we're supposed to be walking through. We're not supposed to settle or dig our roots down. But there are many people that refuse to follow Jesus Christ and they would rather just settle down and be happy with the status quo. The fourth is those who dwelt in Mount Lebanon. Now, what's interesting is it means the White Mountain that has a road that's been made out of bricks that have been made to be white. It means those who forge their own righteousness, legalism, trying to live right, trying to get salvation through the ligging of the law, through the place of worship. The second is the mountain. It means the place of worship of Baal Hermon. It's literally Baal Akramon in the Hebrew. And it means the possessor of Hermon or Kermon. Now what's interesting is Kermon means the chief captain or to make an agreement with another husband. In other words, to share your, your wife or share yourself with another person when you don't belong in them. Which is a terrible thing. It means to live, to give an agreement to yourself to be an adultery. Those are the five lords of the Philistines. In the occult, each one represents a different star point of Satan. There are five points in the star whether they're pinnacle or the pentagram, pointed up or pointed down. That's what they are. Now, why did God leave them there? Verse 4 of chapter 3, it was to prove Israel, the God who prevails. And this word prove, it literally means to assess and show what is real from what is not. In other words, you can go pick a bunch of grain and put it in a basket, but that grain will deteriorate. Mice will come and eat some bugs. If you ever had bugs in your rice or something, they'll eat the tar off. And that's what happens. Is God is saying, this is what's perishing and this is what's real. The God that prevails will save some. But the rest will perish. So verse 5, the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. So the Canaanites summation, that's the sixth of the five. Hivites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hittites, and Jebusites. Verse six, they took their daughters to be wives and gave their daughters to sons to serve their gods. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served Balaam and the groves. Um, Balaam literally means the many faces of Baal. And you find those faces in those five aspects of the Canaanites. When it talks about the groves, it means Ashtoreth. So once again, we're back to, they gave themselves over to the many faces of Baal and Ashtoreth. So in verse 8, we're going to take off with the study of Othniel, our first, first of our deliverers. And in verse 8, we're going to take a look and God's first judge that we find raised up. Othniel means a force of God. 
and not only a force of God, but it's a force of God, and it is sent to destroy deities. It is sent to destroy deities and those that are given over like a dog. So I guess you would call it the dog-headed Egyptian god, or those that have gone back to their own vomit. In other words, they've seen and tasted the Lord, but they puked it up and they went back to, to their old ways. We're going to find various aspects of this when we study about Kushan Arithayim, the king of Mesopotamia. So may the Lord bless you. If you take one thing out of this message, remember this. God loves you very much. It's his great mercy that allows you to be tempted, tried, and vexed by those around you. But you can have the peace and the joy of God. He didn't pray to take you out of it, but rather to keep you, to make you a solid light, to give you the ability to trust in the Lord God. You have that ability. He will give you as much of Jesus as you want. He will empower you to do a job. He's raised you up as an ambassador. He may have made you a judge, a prophet, but we do know that you are a priest and a king under Jesus Christ, if you're his. Pray this, true Lord Jesus Christ, I give myself to you. Separate me from the Canaanites. Separate me from the five lords of the Philistines. Separate my heart, my mind, soul, and spirit unto yourself. And help me, Lord, to be obedient in all my ways. Cleanse me from myself and everything that defiles. I give myself to you. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you in all your endeavors to serve him. This is Dr.